Um, so I think, OK, we will start. Uh, Borida, everybody, really good to see so many of you um, here today. Uh, welcome to the second of our monthly um, Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan webinar, Evolving Together, the journey towards an anti-racist Wales by 2030, because that is the overarching aim of everything we do. Um, I'm Rajvi Glassbrook. I'm a member of the implementation team. Um, today's focus is education. Um, extremely close to my heart. I am a teacher um, and once a teacher, always a teacher. Um, and, you know, as you were sort of, I don't know if you heard the opening of this conversation, you know, we know that in order to make a change, education is the driver, you know, and that's, it, it can't be stated enough. So it's so good to see so many teachers here today. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, we um, encourage you to actively participate by using the Q&A tab. The chat is off for this, but please post your questions throughout as you uh, go. Um, you can also ask questions anonymously, so you don't um, have to um, have your name. We'll address your questions after all the speakers have had a chance to speak. Um, it is uh, quite a packed schedule, so, you know, please keep notes. But again, if anything occurs to you during or after the session, please get in touch and we will aim to respond. Um, if we can't go through all the questions, we will provide a, a sort of written feedback and in, in response following this webinar. So, um, you know, Please, you know, don't be offended at all if we don't get round to your question. Recording and transcription are on, um, so I hope everybody's all right with that. And uh, to ensure the session runs smoothly, uh, we've muted everybody's microphones. Um, so I hope that's OK, too. We'll um, get started without uh, further ado with uh, our first speaker. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have the speakers we've got here today because they're all people who've been very actively involved um, in the formation of this plan. So our first speaker is Professor Emmanuel Ogbonna. Uh, Professor Ogbonna is the Professor in Management and Organisation at Cardiff Business School um, at, uh, in Cardiff University. He is also the co-chair of our external accountability group. And uh, Professor Ogbonna has been part of this journey that and it's been quite a journey for in reaching the anti-racist Wales action plan from the very beginning so thoroughly um, invested in our in the work at every stage of the way uh, Professor Ogbonna will be discussing leading an anti-racist culture change in Welsh higher education institutions um, he has extremely vast and extensive knowledge um, in this area so uh, I hope you find it um, extremely useful um, over to you Professor I think we lost him. Uh, Did we lost Professor Ogbonna? He was with us. Uh, maybe something has happened. In which case, maybe we can swap the agenda around. Uh, Professor Williams, would you be willing to go first? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry <coughs> to have to put you on the spot. Oh, oh. no, Prof oh, Professor Ogbonna, you're there. Okay. Uh, you're on mute. But... Yeah, can you see me? There we go. Yes, Am I excellent. There? Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so again, Borida, and um, thank you for. Um, joining us um, today. My objective this morning is to share my reflections on what leaders of higher education institutions can do to change the cultures of their organizations so that they can become anti-racist organizations in line with the anti-racist Wales Action Plan. Now, the Welsh government has gone for an anti-racist plan, an action plan, because previous plans have not led to meaningful improvements in the lives of people from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. We've already tried integration, we've tried multiculturalism, we've tried the quality of opportunities, we've tried the quality, diversity and inclusion, and they've all failed to shift the dial on inequality and inequity, really. If you take the example of equality, diversity, and inclusion as practiced in many universities, and I work in one, so I should know, you know if you take that as an example, you will find that race has been particularly neglected. Now, don't take my word for it, it is in the report that the Universities UK published in 2021 that universities in the UK have ignored race, uh, or at least tackling racial inequalities 
in favor for other, of other inequalities. So that is a problem that we're trying to deal with uh, uh, under the anti-racist wealth action plan. And what I'm going to do is to talk through what I believe universities should be doing and higher education institutions should be doing to try to redress this balance. And my view is that the first thing that institutions should do is to acknowledge that there is a problem of institutional racism. Again, don't take my word for it. The Qualities and Human Rights Commission a few years ago uh, found that universities in the UK are uh, uh, institutionally racist. You know, they were then, they continue to be now. Now, not many universities have actually, or institutions of higher learning, have actually acknowledged this finding. You know, even when their representative, the UUK representative on equalities, Professor Richardson, urged his fellow vice chancellors to acknowledge institutional racism, you know, very few institutions have so acknowledged. So if you don't acknowledge that there is a problem, there is very little likelihood that you want to solve it. And by the way, you know, the denial of racism is just as bad as racism itself, because that is what perpetuates racism. It fits into the narrative that if there is a problem, it isn't because of racism, it is because of the inadequacies of minority ethnic communities, as opposed to the systems, the policies that are stripped against them in ways that they are unable to uh, 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 um, use their individual agencies to better themselves. So universities and higher education institutions should begin by acknowledging that there is a problem of institutional racism. And once you do that, the next thing to do will be to undertake an equality audit through the realms of racism or race, if you like, you know, by trying to understand where your policies, your systems, your practices may be contributing to the racialized outcomes that we are seeing in higher education institutions. And why do I say that? All institutions of higher learning in Wales and in the UK would say that they are not racist. But all the outcomes we get continue to be racist, or at least racialized, in the sense of whether you look at the gaps in awards, you know, the people who enter universities at roughly the same levels and emerge at vastly different levels that will be dictated by their racial backgrounds, or whether you look at representation in terms of the numbers of people that are employed and their ethnicities and racial uh, backgrounds, and you look at all sorts of areas, whether it is in promotions, the levels at which people are employed, and you see that outcomes are racialized. So what you want to do is to acknowledge the existence of that racism and begin to see, to look for the reasons why that may be occurring. If we take an example of human resource processes and look at that and see what could be happening there. If we do a root and branch review of our HR processes, including looking at how decisions on HR issues are made in these institutions, what we mustn't do is to, we mustn't accept human resource people making decisions on the basis of vague rationales. And that's what we continue to see. You know, why was this person not promoted? Oh, because they have a negative attitude. Oh, because they don't cooperate. You know, these are vague rationales, and these are where you open the room for racism, because you couldn't possibly define what we mean by somebody having a negative attitude, by somebody not cooperating. These are all vague rationales. We want to encourage people to, uh, 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 to, to have objective rationales when they make decisions. We mustn't use things like, oh, this person shows promise, so I'm going to promote them to a senior lectureship or whatever, or professorship or whatever the case may be, when in actual fact, promise is ephemeral. You know, anybody can show promise depending 
on whether you like them as a person and whether you want to help them to advance their careers. You know, these are areas where we can open the routes to racism. This is why we have outcomes that are racialized, but nobody ever admits to being racist. So we we'll want to be able to look at the systems and processes. You know, we also want to be able to generate data you couldn't possibly do this, what we're planning to do without data. Data is key here. We have to be able to generate that. Unfortunately, data is something that many institutions of higher learning don't have, either because people are no longer willing to give their data to a meaningless exercise. Every time people ask you to fill in your identity, your racial identity, nothing ever gets done with it. In fact, people from minority ethnic communities sometimes think that they use that data to target them, so they no longer are willing to share it. So universities and higher education institutions must do more to try and encourage people to provide this data. And this data must be intersectional so that we can begin to see the variety of factors that may be at play, depending on the variety of identities that a single individual may hold. And of course, to understand that ethnic minority people are not homogeneous, you know, they are heterogeneous. There are all sorts of differences which can emerge and data would help us to unravel those differences and begin to understand how we deal with things. A key factor for me to identify or to highlight in this talk is the importance, you know, between in, in trying to draw a distinction between equality and equity. You know, what we've done for generations is to rely on equality. But what we have done is not to focus on equity or to think about equity. Equity is important. Because otherwise, without equity, equality becomes meaningless almost. You know, if it's almost like running a hundred meters race, you know, with the uh, same boat in his head there, and then whatever you do, you are going to lose that race because this person has inbuilt advantages that you don't have. So you've got to think about how you generate equity in. Uh, 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 academic institutions or higher education institutions. There are some things that the law allows us to do. There are others the law doesn't allow us to do. So for example, unlike in the United States and say South Africa, where they use positive discrimination to achieve equity, in the UK, we are not allowed to use positive discrimination, but we are allowed to use positive action. So there is no reason we shouldn't encourage managers and vice chancellors and institutional leaders to use positive action. But for them to use positive action, they need to understand what that means. So we need to be able to train them to understand what positive action means. The idea that you can use tie break to be able to make recruitment decision where a particular group of people may be underrepresented. This is something we need to train managers to understand. The number of people I have spoken to who've confused positive action with positive discrimination, the men. So it's very important that we try to think in that, uh, uh, in that sense as well. But also we could begin to think about other ways of doing achieving equity. For example, why don't we include uh, um, achieving an anti-racist organization in the KPI, the key performance indicators of university vice chancellors and other leaders in universities? You know, why don't we include this in the PDR, the performance development reviews of every manager? and say, how have you, what have you done to contribute to this objective? If something is important to us, we normally try to do it. So if this is important, as it now is in Wales, we should do everything to try to achieve it. So these are the things that we can begin to do. So training is a very important element. Why don't we encourage or indeed insist that everybody participates in an anti-racism training of some sort? In many institutions, they are trying that now, but many uh, colleagues are, for whatever reason, choosing not to attend that training 
either because the university hasn't stressed the level of importance that uh, they are attributing to this, or because colleagues are struggling to catch up with that aspect of it. Either way, this is important. And my final point really is that we need to understand, especially university leaders need to understand that it is very difficult to achieve a hearts and minds change in relation to uh, uh, um, intractable identity issues such as gender, such as race. We know that in universities from race, from gender, sorry, you know, for many years, uh, uh, gender was again neglected in universities uh, uh, and higher education institutions until a certain Athena Swan came into the scene in the 2000s. And from then, universities have begun to try harder to try to uh, do something about gender. It doesn't mean they've achieved parity in any way, shape or form, but they are doing a lot more on gender today than they did before Athena Swan. And that's because Athena Swan had the punitive element. It was linked to the finances of universities. So we should expect a race equality charter that is linked to the finances of universities to encourage the same type of change. Now, that change isn't based on hearts and minds. We hope you would, uh, over a longer period of time, become hearts and minds. But the fact that it is being linked to income means that we are working on the basis, like Athena Swan, that universities and institutions of higher education will only take something seriously when it hits the bottom line. So this is going to hit the bottom line, and as such, it's going to encourage more institutions to do that. But we would hope that institutions will do it because it is the right thing to do. And if we do it because it's the right thing to do, over time, everybody will begin to develop this learned behavior towards being anti-racist. Anti-racism is the way to go for any developed institutions and organizations and societies. And we would hope that you will be able to join us in this journey. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Ogbonna, for a really powerful and candid and clear summation of what is a deeply like rooted systemic issue with our um, institutions. And it's exactly, as you say, Professor, it's that acknowledgement and understanding that's the start of the change and positive action. Um, and change needs action. And that is not positive discrimination by any means. It's uh, something a lot more powerful and positive and using the levers that institutions have to make that change. So thank you very much for that. Following on um, really well from that, we're very lucky to have Professor Charlotte Williams uh, with us today. Uh, Professor Charlotte Williams, OBE, uh, Professor Emeritus of Bangor University, um, non-executive director of ESTIN. Um, Professor Williams is also an advisory board member for the Black Leadership Group UK and a key part of our external accountability group, like Professor Rog Bonner. Um, Professor Charlotte Williams uh, chaired um, in uh, uh, chaired the working group for the report as we that we all now know is the Kenevin report. Um, it is a report to basically make us the first nation in UK that has made the teaching of black history mandatory. It was beyond a privilege for me to work um, on that working group because the work that you know that has come from it is absolutely transformative or has the potential to be for our schools um, and it really reflects that it's not black history it's history and so it's all our history is the way we should be looking at it so um i'll introduce uh, that's you know enough of an introduction i suppose because i could be here all day um really you know but if anyone hasn't looked at that Kenevin report yet you know please do it's uh, an extremely powerful piece of work um thank you professor williams Yelton Valley and Radvi and Bonadar Paub. Um, we've got 10 minutes to tell you quite a big story here, uh, but I'm delighted to do so. Our anti racist Wales action plan, and I say our because as a nation, we are committing to this plan, commits us to six main areas in respect of schools the curriculum work that uh, Rajvi outlined there, to having a more representative workforce. There are, um, if you have a look at the um, 
plan, there are, is a commitment in terms of greater representation of Black, Asian and minority ethnic people in the workforce. The initial teacher education, um, encouraging more uh, teachers to train, those from uh, Black and minority backgrounds to train and be recruited into the Welsh workforce. There are um, commitments in terms of Gypsy Roma travellers, updating the guidance to schools. There are commitments in terms of tackling racism in schools and the reporting of racism and the general well-being of young people in schools. And there are commitments in terms of the Welsh language, encouraging more people, for example, from uh, minority backgrounds into Welsh medium education. And what I can uh, report is a very positive picture at the moment in terms of infrastructure development to um, ensure that we are tracking well against these objectives. So, uh, for example, we have a whole suite of professional learning that is being accessed through DARPL, the Diversity and Anti-Racist Professional Learning Virtual Campus. We have a, a huge amount of resource development going on, not only uh, given the commitment of the government in resource development, but I am frequently being asked to review resources that are being produced by a plethora of organisations to support the curriculum. Uh, BBC Bite Size being one example. Uh, there's guidance for governors. There's, a, you know, a general sense of awareness across all uh, sectors of the workforce that this work is um, underway, that feeling of it being underway. Qualifications Wales, WJEC are looking at assessment, assessment tools in this respect. Um, and there's some wonderful projects going on in schools, uh, one of which I wanted to mention from Priscelli School, where the children have produced their own version of the anti-racist action plan, their own interpretation. The, 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 the pupils and the teachers have worked together in a Kinevin project to produce this document. So there's lots of um, good uh, practice being developed and being shared. My reflection on things that are a little bit slower on the mark are that some uh, areas of Wales are yet to uh, schools and, and uh, professionals and practitioners are yet to deeply engage with this initiative. And my big message today is to urge you to have a look at what is available on the DARPL uh, virtual campus website to equip yourself as, as practitioners and people in the education workforce to take this forward. The government can lay out an infrastructure of support, but actually until people start uh, engaging with it deeply, uh, thinking about it, having dialogue, looking at what's available, drawing on these resources, we're not going to move forward in a sustainable way. I wanted to say something about the models in use as well. Uh, in the curriculum. What we're not looking for is this kind of additive approach where, you know, maybe in Black History Month, there's some uh, kinds of celebratory activity going on, or um, it's a kind of add on to a lesson plan that where um, attention to a contribution from an ethnic minority individual is celebrated. What we actually want is a much more transformative approach to integrating these perspectives in every area of learning and experience. And as Rajvi was just saying, our brief from our first minister is that black history is Welsh history and Welsh history is black history. So we want an embedded and transformative approach. I think it's important to say, however, that the curriculum alone will not achieve on the plan. 
what we need also to see is a whole school approach where the culture of the school, just as Professor Rod Bonner has described in relation to higher education, will need to be a learning organisation. We'll need to think about how it presents itself, its image, its culture, the feel, the structure of feeling of the school will be important. And then uh, another reflection is, how will we know we're getting there? What will be some of those indicators or measures of success? And the plan gives us a steer. It talks about uh, children and young people talking about uh, lessons being more relevant, the content of their learning feeling more relevant to them uh, and their position. But it's not only about those children and young people from minority backgrounds. It's clear that the brief is for all pupils, all teachers, all schools right across Wales to be uh, involved and engaged in this initiative, because one of the four purposes of the curriculum is that we will enable ethical and informed citizens of Wales and the world, our young people to be ethical and informed citizens of Wales and the world. My final few points are about what's going to make a difference as we go forward. We, we've, we've seen a great push in relation to uh, what's happening in schools, but what's going to make the difference? And in the Kinevin report, we talked about leavers, leaders and learners. Um, and, and just a synopsis of that is thinking about what kinds of key levers are going to drive forward this agenda. And these are things, I think, like um, the WJEC's commitment to looking at assessment tools, I think will be very important in driving changes in the curriculum. There'll be things like Estin's review, which um, is a review, an initial review is scheduled for 2024 and a full thematic review is scheduled for five years from the report. So we're looking at 2026 for that. I think that kind of review will be important. Uh, Estin's new uh, inspecting the future framework, HMIs are being geared up to ask those questions of schools as they do their, their review of schools. So those kinds of levers are going to be important. But the real learning comes from schools taking on a dialogic, what we call a dialogue, uh, dialogic commitment to their own internal review as a continuous process of evaluation. How are we doing? Let's put it on our agenda. Let's discuss. Let's talk about uh, what kinds of initiatives, proactive initiatives, because anti-racism is about being proactive, not just about being non-discriminatory uh, to make the change. And how can we share? Peer-to-peer -peer learning is going to be so important. Professor Ogbonna talked about learned behaviour. When we get schools that are demonstrating excellence in this way and they share uh, with other schools through uh, forums, regional forums of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Don't be left behind. I think it's going to be um, very, very significant. So uh, another point will be those schools that are able to link this um, initiative into other things that they're doing, like the Healthy Schools Scheme, talking about well-being of people, seeing uh, racism in schools as fundamentally damaging to the well-being of children and young people from minority backgrounds. So using that opportunity to link what you're doing in terms of wider policy and practice with embedding uh, these perspectives and this lens, let's call it the race lens, on what you're doing. I think I want to, to talk a little bit about um, um, statutory equality plans, making those active documents. We can pick that up later. My conclusion is that if we're looking to the anti-racist school, 
um, the culture of the school, its curriculum, its profile, its portrait into the future. Don't underestimate the amount of change that's going to be needed. We are in for the long haul, but start that journey. Nothing's going to happen without you, the implementers, taking this initiative forward. Diolchenbaum. Professor Williams, uh, for that, you know, just so much to take away from that. And uh, as they say, if it's start of a very, very important journey, um, and it's more than the curriculum, it's the culture, as Professor Williams says. So a huge thank you um, for that. Um, we'll um, go over now to a slightly different perspective. So we've heard from our two professors. We'll now hear from our policy colleagues from the Welsh Government who are making a lot of this change happen and driving it forward. Um, we've got uh, three members from our team. We have Envis Dixie, uh, who uh, leads on schools um, and education in schools. Marion Jeb, uh, who leads on further education and Craig Greenland um, on higher education. Um, so I'll hand it um, over to them. They will discuss the government's efforts in relation to the progress so far with the Anti-Racist Wells Action Plan, because contained within the Anti-Racist Wells Action Plan are a series of goals and actions. Um, and there are quite a lot, some short term, some long term, but there's a really intensive amount of uh, work there. Um, and uh, I'd uh, like to uh, welcome them to provide their insights. Thank you very much, team. Thanks, Rajvi. Diolch. Um, I think I'll go first. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm I'm Envis. Um, I head up the Children and Young People's Rights in Education branch. Um, and it was like music to my ears, really, to hear Professor Ogbonas talk about equality and equity there. Um, my division is called the Equity and Education Division, and that's definitely, um, you know, where our starting point um, when when we talk about uh, anti-racism. So um, I'll just speak first about the work that we've been doing and will be doing um, in relation to schools and then hand over to my colleagues. Um, so, you know, as um, Professor Williams set out there, in the last 12 to 18 months, we've really been focused on, on two primary goals, which is to increase the recruitment of teachers from ethnic minority communities and also embed anti-racist practices within the education sector, or at least start embedding um, anti-racism. So um, we've seen some significant accomplishments, as Professor Williams has set out, um, notably the establishment of an in initial teacher education recruitment plan um, and a financial incentive for um, students um, and uh, new teachers from, from different ethnic minority communities, um, the development of new anti-racist professional learning resources, um, the, the real you know, reform and change that we're seeing in the new curriculum at the moment, um, which opens lots of lots of new opportunities for schools to really think creatively about how we teach um, the different histories and experiences of all, all our different communities, um, and also really embedding that diversity and human rights angle into, you know, those two things are real cross-cutting themes within the new curriculum now, um, and that's to be welcomed too. So I'll just start really briefly with DARPL, which is the Diversity and Anti-Racist Professional Learning Project. That's our one-stop shop really for practitioners and senior leaders um, to access very high quality and free professional learning and resources to embed anti-racism, the specific anti-racism resources and learning there for governors and for leaders. Um, so if you haven't accessed them already, please do. Um, we've got at the moment there's almost uh, 25,000 leaders and educators in Wales that have engaged um, whether you know events consultations resources um, within DARPL and um, that offer now is being extended to the early years childcare and play sectors and the further education sector too. Um, over the next year, I think DARPL now will will look to um, extend their virtual campus, which is, as I said, that that one stop shop. And there's going to be a much you know, a focus on on wider dissemination of that work. Um, initial teacher education, we really recognise the importance of, of representation um, within the education system. Um, you know, I, I a key real memory for me, I guess, of of being in in a forum in a meeting um, with uh, lots of teachers and ex-teachers, and, and and people from different different communities 
when we asked the question about why there was such a small number of um, teachers from ethnic minority communities within our education system, I think it's about 1.6 percent. When about um, it's about 13, 14 percent now of our of our children, and young people from different um, communities. So it's really not representative of our education system. Um, you know, the answer was well. Why would I want to go into education when that's where I experience racism for the first time? It's not, it's not a, a, an environment that I want to be in ever again. Um, and that really spoke volumes because that really brings home the importance of creating an education system which is truly anti-racist because that will set in set in stone really the future for lots of our children, and young people. Um, so recruitment and retention are, are you know two real very important things. Um, for us and, and you know as I said we've got a financial incentive and a new recruitment plan um, and for the 2022-23 academic year we supported around 45 student teachers um, in that incentive scheme and further detail on that on that cohort will be available in due course. Um, we do recognise though there's still a lot more to do um, we know that there are still incidents of racism happening in our schools um, and not just among children, young people and their peers, but among teachers and practitioners, too. Um, and that really speaks to what Professor, Professor Williams just said in terms of the importance of leadership, the importance of, um, of, of culture within a school um, and that real sense of, of nurture, but not, you know, not just for children and people, but for teachers as well. They need to feel included and welcomed and celebrated within their workplace. Um, so over the next few months, um, we will be publishing our new guidance to support Gypsy, Roma and Traveller children and people in schools. Um, uh, that will um, be published hopefully uh, in November. We'll also be updating our stat statutory anti-bullying guidance to strengthen the guidance for schools to tackle prejudice related bullying. And um, the Children's Commissioner for Wales um, is about to bring out a, a report, we think next month on experiences of racism in secondary schools after lots of, of engagement with young people themselves. So that will be a key part of um, a key piece of work which will inform that, that guidance. Um, and we're also going to continue to work on strengthening the reporting and monitoring of incidents um, of racist bullying and harassment in schools. And that's a real long term piece of work. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Marion. Thank you. Thanks, Envis. I, th I think like, like every speaker here today, I could probably fill up the whole hour really easily on my own. So I'm going to. Um, try to do what doesn't come naturally to me and be really concise. I'm going to talk very briefly about what we do in the further education sector, which is my area of responsibility in the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan. I'm going to try and focus on just two main things because we have been doing like 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 all, all of my colleagues have been doing a great deal over the last 18 months. So I'll I'll try and really focus on the headlines. As both Professor Ogbonna and Professor Williams talked about um, our focus on FE has really been and continues to be on trying to establish an anti-racist culture um, across our sector as a whole. For those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with the FE sector, um, we have a relatively small sector in terms of number of institutions. We've got 13 FE institutions in Wales, but the range of what they do is exceptionally diverse. Um, learners of all ages from 16 up, all levels, all abilities and every um, educational sector and industry that you can imagine. So coming up with a coherent vision for that and, and making sure that anti-racism is embedded across everything is a challenging um, piece of work that, that we've embarked upon. I'm going to concentrate on one major area of progress and, and one major challenge that, that we face. In terms of progress, I think it's right to say that we've had an exceptionally high level of buy-in and commitment from the FE sector, helped in no small part by our work with the Black Leadership Group, whom um, Professor Williams mentioned in, in her presentation. Um, this is a UK wide group which supports leadership in, in all um, education sectors, but started in FE and we've got very strong uh, support and challenge um, from the Black Leadership Group and from our whole FE anti-racist steering group, which has enabled us to get to where we are. 
the position that we have is that all our colleges are affiliated with the Black Leadership Group now. All of them also have their own anti-racist action plans in place since March this year, and we're going to be getting them to do progress updates for us in December so that we can see what we're doing. There is a real engagement and belief in the anti-racist ambition in, in the FE sector. And we've got a, a small enough and tight knit enough sector that we've been able to work with them in a really hands-on way to try and drive that, that forward. The challenge we face is, is related to the range and diversity of the sector that I mentioned. Unlike the schools sector, Professor Williams has, has, has explained the approach to making um, black history and anti-racism an integral part of the school's curriculum. We don't have a single curriculum in FE, so we don't have the same opportunity to build it in fundamentally across the piece. So the approach we're taking to try and remedy that is a really ambitious and unique project to develop um, an anti-racist um, set of curriculum modules and tutorials and a pedagogy that can be used across the FE sector. That project is led by Cardiff and Vale College, who were really providing incredible leadership to bring together a virtual campus. And over the next year, we'll be continuing to develop that and to support professional learning across the sector to help deliver uh, that that new curriculum. We've got a long way to go in FE, as in all of the areas of education that, that we're talking about this morning. We've recently completed research with our learners and staff, which shows that racism absolutely is an issue in FE, as it is in all parts of society, particularly incidents of covert racism that people don't always feel able to recognise or call out or that, that, that they will be taken seriously. So we know that that's the area we've got to focus on. I think that as, as everyone else ha has said today, we're at a stage where we've made a strong start. We've got some of the foundations, we've got the commitment and the will, and it's a question for us of keeping up the momentum in the months and years to come, as, as I know it is for every sector. Thank you. I will hand that on, on to Craig. Thank you. Um, thank you, firstly, for the opportunity to um, to attend this morning's meeting. Um, I will try and be concise as well, but um, like the other speakers, it doesn't come naturally to me. So, uh, so maybe it's an education thing. I don't know. Maybe it's a trait in education, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the five actions uh, that we that are contained in the uh, three Wales action plan for for higher education that are delivered through uh, essentially through the higher education funding council for Wales that we support. Um, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to try not to go off piece too much. But I think there's some really good points uh, already raised on in the register. I kind of want to reflect on because I think they're so important in the context of my area as well. So. Um, just just to kind of go back a little to the to, to the action plan the the actions uh in it relate to uh, establishing an anti-racism network across the sector um that's been up and running for quite some time now i think about eight nine months at least um and uh, the the feedback has been quite positive in 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 that sense um it seems to be running quite well members are joining um all the time and i think it, it goes back to the point raised uh, earlier in the conversation peer to peer learning as well so i think i think there's a lot more that now can be used for in relation to sharing best practice and and, and driving forward the the changes needed particularly the cultural changes needed it's been mentioned a few times already this morning and i think it's super important there's also um an action around publishing uh for for hefku to publish an annual rest, uh, a quality report with performance measures. So that report, I understand, is either the first year will of report will be uh, published within four weeks or so. Um, so I think that's going to be give us all a really good insight, hopefully, into into maybe baselining where we are. And I think it does go back to that really crucial issue around accountability and KPIs, et cetera, et cetera, and understanding what's in that report and, and maybe how it needs to evolve in the future. Um, there's also an action around, again, this has been mentioned, around uh, organisations and institutions reviewing their policies and practices. Uh, that's 
very much a work in progress across the sector in, with many institutions. I think it's something that needs to evolve and will probably maybe should never end and, and, and those kind of policies and practices need to be under review um, or, you know, as and when necessary. Um, there's also an action around uh, higher institutions monitoring and addressing inequalities, including uh, pay disparities. So um, HEFCU have provided some guidance just recently on that for for institutions. So um, again, that's going to be something which we need as a Welsh government and as HEFCU is the regulator. I think there's a lot of engagement in the sector we can and are doing. Um, not just in year one, but we're in years two, three, etc. And as new anti-racist Wales action plans evolve, evolve thereafter, there's also a commitment within the action plan for um, for organisations to sign up to the Race Equality Charter, which is a condition of funding um, or, or an element of funding. So Hefco have made around one million pounds available across the sector, to, which is really a uh, supporting organisations to try and drive cultural change in this area. Um, so, in a nutshell, they're the they're the five um, actions and some of the some of the programs. Um, I think it's really interesting because I've, like other colleagues, we've had to reflect on some of the challenges around this work. And I think one of the key challenges uh, was the data. So, for example, I think there's 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 a lot more we need to understand around data, and I mentioned in the annual race equality report that will be published shortly. But I think it's really about what you do with it, and I think if if institutions and um, organisations are gonna um, um, gonna g willingly give their data, then they really need to understand what we're doing with it and how we're using that to drive positive change. And the other thing that I just quickly wanted to mention, because I know time is short. It's the kind of positive discrimination versus positive action. I spent many, many years before taking this role in the equality space, and I just think that's so important. And I've encountered in, uh, instances in the past where, like was said this morning, there's confusion around uh, the difference between the two. And also, I, I think uh, not just confusion, but I, I don't necessarily think institutions are necessarily confident around how to apply a positive action, when to apply it, and they they sometimes worry about um, the perception of implementing positive action. So um, yeah, I shall stop there, but they are my thoughts. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Craig Envis, and I'm so sorry about this. Uh, my uh, Lucy Cat is very passionate about education too. A uh, huge thank you to uh, Envis, Marion, and Craig. Uh, you know, lots of really purposeful joined up work happening there. Um, and I think, as Envis said, it's you know, it's very much set the foundation, and now it's sort of for institutions to build on. But there is so much work um, that's clearly happening. Um, it's, now it's time for the question and answer session. There are some really good questions um, in the uh, Q&A session. We may not be able to get around to all of them, as we said, but if not, we will provide um, a feed and written feedback to all your questions that will be shared with everyone who's in attendance um, today. Um, as we approach the end of the event, I'd really like to express heartfelt gratitude, um, you know, from myself and from our whole implementation team for, every, for everyone who's taken the time to join this session, um, to speak this, in, at this session and really, really support our work. I think it's really encouraging. It shows that there is that appetite for change and that's often the hardest hurdle uh, to beat. So thank you very much also to our speakers for their valuable time. Um, and we really appreciate uh, your, pre you know, your presence here. Going to questions, I'll try to direct them to the right um, person. Uh, and, but on the whole, there I think the please come in, um, all of you. You know, Professor Rog Bonner, Professor Williams, Craig Envis, and Marion, as you see fit, um, because I think that a lot of them sort of cut across um, what we're saying. First question, um, it's from George Baldwin. Um, how useful can the whole school approach to emotional and mental well-being in schools be towards working towards an anti-racist Wales? Um, I don't know who wants to go first on that. Would you like to, um, Envis? Yeah, um, I mean, yes, oh, yeah, <laughs> very, very, very mm. useful and very important. Um, I mean, that piece of work is, is a wider 
um, kind of the responsibility for that policy does sit wider within my division. It's very much um, comes we we come from an equity perspective when we think about that whole whole school approach. Um, I think for us, and I think what the anti-racist Wales action plan has really brought is the the better understanding of the fact that you know if if a child or young person is experiencing issues with their own well-being um in relation to for example racism or, or bullying in school that the support that they get is is made applicable and specific to them um, and so what we hear a lot from young people is that you know when they when they need support or when they look for support with something like um, racism or other types of prejudice related bullying that they that they're looking for support for somebody who may, who looks like them or maybe who shares some of that experience and um, somebody who understands where they're coming from um, and so I think that's you know, a longer term goal is to make sure that the support is there for schools to be able to access that type of quite, you know, sometimes quite specific support um, and possibly is something that isn't as, you know, wide, uh, isn't as um, widespread or as widespread as it should be at the moment. Totally agree. And Professor Williams, you um, spoke of um you know, being ethically informed citizens, which is one of the four purposes, as we know, as part of the curriculum for Wales, um, and health and well-being runs right through that. So um, just your comments yeah, on this as well would be welcome. Important responsibility in terms of everyone in, this, in the school environment to promote uh, well-being of each other. And I, I think, you know, this is such an important issue. I, I do worry for children children from minority backgrounds in this respect, because I'm perfectly sure that we have had significant evidence from show racism, the red card, the commissioner's reports coming out. We looked at an awful lot of evidence um, from uh, children at school and I've uh, stood on platforms many a time and said, um, no, child, no child should go to school to be abused, you know, to ha have to manage um, abuse or insult or or derogatory comment and yet it's so common and when i've been talking about the curriculum with um parents and wider public this is the issue that more people bring up than than anything so um yes i i i rushed over it but embedding um well you know it this issue in the notion of well-being and in well-being initiatives is, is so important and uh, thank you for that question because it is what parents want to hear and want to know that their children feel safeguarded at school. Absolutely and I think you've just hit the nail on the head Professor Williams it is a safeguarding issue and I know there's a lot of work currently underway we, we talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences and in many ways racism for many of our minor, you know, minority ethnic children is an adverse childhood experience it stays with them so you know thank you very much for that question. Um, the next one I might target um, to you as well Professor Williams and anybody else feel free to come in um, and it's about terminology so we I know the word black is being used as an inclusive term um, and Professor Williams has also mentioned gypsy traveller communities. Um, what work, so that, that you know that, that terminology is one part of the question, but what work, second part of the question being what part, what work is being done on encouraging the incorporation of Asian histories, particularly mm -hmm. colonial histories, journeys of migration, um, issues like the partition, for example. Yeah, yeah, fabulous, fabulous question, because um, funnily enough, I was speaking at a conference, just a Black History conference just uh, this last week, and we were talking about how the word black encompasses those of um, African and those of the African diaspora Caribbean peoples. Um, and, you know, that really that that in itself can become exclusive. And the Kinevin report, as we call it, was very clear that we are talking about black, Asian and minority ethnic histories broadly, very broadly. Um, but I think we need to get beyond that kind of specific and start to try with schools to give them the confidence to work with those big themes, the colonialism, imperialism, empire. And once we've got a kind of framework for thinking about those big themes and we can communicate those in ways that are relevant to different age groups, uh, you know, across the school population. 
then they can draw on their own histories and bring those to bear on those common themes that cut across um, groups that have been oppressed, past, present, you know, groups that have significant and specific histories. And it's a way of framing assessments so that um, uh, young people can take their own paths and their own specific examples, but use some of those big coordinating ideas. Um, and those are big words, but those words unite that that whole group that of, of perspectives that we're um, talking about. I think the Welsh Government materials that are being produced and are, are being available are very sensitive to picking out different ethnicities as a starting point so that um, teachers can, you know, take, um, as you said, the example of Indian partition, for example, and, and begin to open that up from, from a small example. The coordinating theme is Story Cymru. Wales's connections with the world past and present, the migrations in and the migrations out. And if we keep that frame, then we are going to be able to touch in on all of the relevance of all of those histories to Wales. Yeah, absolutely. Would anybody else like to come in on that, Envis? Yeah, and just wanted to pick up that that issue of confidence is key, isn't it? It's the confidence of any any of all of our teachers and all of our leaders to actually deal with some, you know, these are these are really, really, you know, very um difficult issues to 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 have discussions about with your peers and adults, never mind young people. But what we know from young people and children is that they will ask questions and that they will, you know, they 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 want they they they're sponges, right? So they want to know more about these things. So it's like it's that confidence to be able to to deal with these really difficult, often conversations, but in age appropriate ways, um, and developmentally appropriate ways, um, that are sensitive to those cultures as well that you've got in front of you. So you know, a question that I get a lot from teachers is around how do we deal with um maybe uh, texts or or um resources that maybe um have derogatory derogatory terms or, or racist slurs or terms in them you know how do we actually deal with that in the classroom um you know i want to be we want to be confident in in bringing these things up with our students to have the conversation how do we do that in a way that is a sensitive to considering the children that we've got in front of us but actually maybe that the teacher doesn't have the lived experience themselves and you know so and i, I think that's where darple comes in and, and being able to have those conversations and that and that professional learning and those con those discussions with peers and other teachers, um, some of whom will have lived experience or different experiences to have to, you know, but I think maybe there's something there about maybe we need to 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 provide clearer guidance on on some of those more kind of nuanced things as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Envis. And then um, the last question, and I am aware that there are, there are several questions that haven't been answered. And as I say, we will uh, provide a written feedback on that. Uh, the next one is more for Professor Og Bonner and Craig. Um, but again, no, all of you feel free to come in. Um, and it's uh, following on from Craig's point that many institutions don't understand positive action, uh, what that means. So what are the Welsh Government doing to help them and what can the Welsh Government do to help those institutions? Uh, because a lot of policy reporting is about uh, professors, uh, about professors like networking and providing support, but what are the outcomes we wish to secure and uh, what can we do to help further? Um, Professor, first. Okay, I think that's a really good um, question and it is also a question that is at the heart of the outcomes that we are uh, um, finding. So we think we are doing all the things we can. We are following a quality of opportunities, but we are having outcomes that are racialized, largely because you know people are applying a colorblind approach without due regard to the historical uh, 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 anomalies that have afflicted particular groups of um, people in the society and really institutions of higher learning should understand and do understand that they have they are quasi public sector organizations so they are under uh, covered under uh, um, public sector equality duties i imagine so they are legally 
uh, child to not mm. discriminate or to do everything possible to ensure that uh, groups of people are not discriminated against. So this is uh, the law and it's the law that they are not applying. And under the Qualities Act of 2010, there are specific provisions on that that talk about uh, uh, um, positive action and how you can use that. And there are also consultancies and individuals out, out there that would be able to train them in this uh, uh, um, tool if it is what they want to use. It isn't particularly difficult. It's just that people have an aversion to anything that implies uh, equalizing opportunities artificially because people like to believe that everybody has the same opportunity to achieve or to do anything. And people dislike it when you say to them that what they have achieved may be anything other than their hard work. And it may not necessarily be what you are saying. All you are saying is that you are not being as fair as you can to other members of the community. But you are right. This is something that um, perhaps the Welsh government policy makers should take away and see how they can maybe through HFQ or other organizations and institutions try to help these institutions to be able to train their people to become more confident about positive action. I think that's what they have been doing, by the way. You know, what they've been doing is positive action only in favor of white people. Because positive action, for instance, in, in recruitment does not say that if you have a black, a minority ethnic, Asian, uh, um, Gypsy Roma traveler candidate that is less qualified than a white person, that you should take them. No, that's not positive action. It doesn't say that. It says that if you have two people that are at the same level, identical candidates, that you can choose the candidate that is underrepresented. What we've been doing is positive action in favor of white. So if they are at the same level, we choose white. So that is a positive action. Only it's not favoring um, the people that are underrepresented. Thank you very, very much, Professor Rob Warner. Um, I hope that, you know, I think that really directly answers the question, um, and I hope it does. Uh, we are overrunning slightly, so absolute apologies, but I think, as we know, we could have, this could have been a week-long conference. There is so much to discuss here. Um, so, you know, thank you very much. Um, as we approach the end of the event, uh, now again, thank you very, very much to all the speakers and all of you for attending. Um, it would be really helpful if uh, you uh, leave a comment on how you found the session and what you'd like to see in future sessions. It helps us uh, shape these webinars so please uh, please feel free to do that um, our next uh, webinar will be on the 22nd of november and the focus is on health um, please you know do attend if you um, can all of you who are on in the session today uh, will be forwarded the link automatically anyone new who's interested um, you just need to fill in a form and return to our uh, mailbox but um, now again Diok and Vaudi Aoneto for a really stimulating discussion and uh, we will be in touch with everybody with feedback to questions that we haven't answered and any follow-ups please contact the uh, Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan implementation team um, more discussion you know the more broadly we can sort of work together to build on this the better thank you very much everybody bye have a lovely day <laughs>